Our first paper um, is by Mariana Daggi and is entitled Gold Jewelry of the Archaeological Museum of Thessaloniki, Results of a Research with Different Approach. Mrs. Daggi, you have 15 minutes at your disposal. <laughs> Thank you very much. Since 2006, I have had the opportunity to carry out first-hand to carry out first-hand study. Is it okay? To carry out first-hand study on jewelry finds found in northern Greece. These are from late classical and early Hellenistic tombs, from mainly around the Thermaic Gulf. The sites can be seen on this map. This means 83 items of jewelry studied from 27 graves and of 10 sites. The greater part of the pieces is preserved here in the Archaeological Museum of Thessaloniki. Due to the technical-based examination with microscope and the method of comparative technical analysis, my research provided new information about making and decorative techniques, the use and function, as well as makers of the jewelry, which sheds new light on the previously published pieces too. I present and summarize here only a few examples which illustrate whether the technical approach to what kind of results and conclusions can lead us. By examining the objects with microscope and using my practical experience in making jewelry, I was able to uncover a rich repertoire of manufacturing techniques, including several details that were not mentioned in the literature before. It has also clearly proven that, bes that besides learning about the, the actual physical process of making of the jewelry, it is possible to discover the knowledge required for the creation and sometimes the way of thinking of the goldsmiths. Goldsmiths could use technical solutions or special tools that made it easier to make the jewelry or made it possible to prepare certain shapes more precisely and nicely. Such technical tricks may have spread widely or only in a region or a, small, uh, or a smaller circle, for example in a workshop, or perhaps only one goldsmith knew them. On the technical, uh, one of the technical tricks is the so-called narrowing cut. It can be observed on the bow fibulae of tomb gamma and, and on the pair of appliques with complex floral decoration from the grave of Oreocastro Street in Stavropolis. This technical trick solved the same problem on each piece. It reduced the abundance of the, the arch truncated cone or hemispherical shaped sheets and so prevented the wrinkling of the sheet. Narrowing cuts are applied on the truncated cones of the biconical beads on the fibulae, as well as on the spheres decorating the catch plates. So the sheets took the shape more easily and didn't wrinkle when they were embossed. As a comparison, the goldsmiths of the Mirturi from Vergina didn't use this trick, thus the hemispherical part of the flowers were wrinkled. This technical trick can be observed on bull's head hoop earrings from Egypt and Cyprus too. So the question is whether the narrowing cut can, can be linked to the production of certain forms, and thus it was widely known, perhaps even or already in earlier periods, or it is more specific to Macedonia, from where it may have spread to the areas that came into contact with it. It was, also, yes, it was also possible to identify preliminary incisions on the studied jewelry. The very thin incised lines can be seen on the reefs from the Derveni tombs, from tombs Alpha, Vita, and Delta, on the reef fragments from the grave A at Sedis, and on the octagonal applique from the grave found in Oreocastro Street in Stavropolis. On the base sheet of the applique, and on the central floor of the Myrtle Reef of Tomb Delta from Derveni, these can be considered as construction lines as they help to construct geometric shapes, an octagon and a circle divided into eight parts. 
On the mere to reef of two vita from Derveni, the goldsmiths used preliminary incisions for making the leaves. He marked the outlines of the leaves and the places of the central veins, which then he embossed with using a negative form. The analysis of technical details also provided new information on the jewelry making process. All the three studied myrtle reefs from Derveni, which are preserved whole, clearly testify that they are result of a careful preliminary planning. Not only the size of the support, the arrangement of the branches on the reef and the arrangement of leaves, flowers, and berries on the branches were planned, but other details were also calculated, such as the thickness of the wire required for making the stem of berries and the fixing ring soldered onto the stems and the diameter of hole on the bottom of the berries in order that the fixing rings keep the berries in their place. The tightly fitting tubular structure of the central flower on the reef of Tomb Delta couldn't have been made without planning and prior calculations either. All this proves that the ancient goldsmiths didn't miss the design phase in the process of making jewelry. During this, the goldsmith brought the customer's needs into harmony with technical feasibility. He planned what each component should look like, what their size should be, how they should be made, where and how they should be placed on the, pe on the piece of jewelry. He also had to think out the details that required complicated or special technical solutions because this could have influenced the making of the whole object. In certain cases, he had to do mathematical calculations or make an experimental piece so that he determined the size of sheets and wires needed to make particular elements and that the proportion of the components were adequate compared to each other. Comparative technical analysis of jewelry of a single type makes it possible to identify the fixed and variable details of the type, and thus we can identify features of maker or place of manufacture. The formal identity of the pieces makes this easier, since it is easier to identify differences between identical shapes than to find common features of different shapes which indicate the same hand or place of manufacture. On this basis, for example, it was possible to distinguish clearly the makers of the Myrtle Reefs of Derveni and Stavropolis. Comparison of structure, technical details, and design concept of the three reefs and their each element made it possible to determine the characteristics of the type of the two-leveled Myrtle Reef, as well as the goldsmiths who made them. Thus, three different goldsmiths could be identified who knew very well the scheme of making a mirror reef that indicates they probably worked in the same place of production. I have also managed to attribute the different types of jewelry from the tomb gamma et sedes to a single hand. The diadem, earrings, fibulae, pendant, and necklace were made by the same goldsmith. Technical features typical of him are the followings. He did work of uneven quality. For example, his filigree wires were uneven, and he cut the shapes inaccurately. He had problems with the soldering. For example, he soldered the components together only on points or sections, or the soldering material didn't melt it, or on contrary, it flooded the decoration. He used patches to hide the damages erosion during soldering. He used negative forms, which, make, which made it easier to execute the figures and other decoration. He also applied technical tricks, which made his work easier. For example, he left a flat rim around figures to solder the two halves together easier. According to the coexistence of all these features, these pieces of jewelry can be attributed to the so-called Cedes Goldsmiths. 
Using the comparative technical analysis, it was also possible to discover links between pieces which were found in different sites. The most spectacular piece from Tum Gamma is the diadem made of lyre-shaped elements and decorated with an arrow's figure. I had opportunity to study personally its closest an analogy, which is the gold diadem from Verena, and it was possible to draw some conclusions about the similarities and differences between the two objects and their make makers. The Cedes goldsmith made the figural and the most of the ornamental elements with negative forms, and he joined together as few components with solder as possible. The numerous patches, the uneven quality of his filigree wires, and the inaccurate cutting of the leaves all indicate that the maker was not too accurate, and also he had trouble with the more complex technical procedures. However, he exploited his modest skills and limited technical knowledge to the maximum to make an aesthetically pleasing and novel piece of jewelry, which seems at first sight to be a masterpiece. By contrast, the maker of the Vergina diadem applied soldering to fix the edges of the sheets used for the tubes perfectly, to fix the spirals made of tubes to each other, to join the corkscrew spirals to the palmettes, and probably who also soldered the acanthus leaves on the tube of fly elements. In addition, he even used enamel decoration, which means an additional controlled heating process of the finished elements without melting them. All these details testify that the goldsmith of the Vergina diadem was a real virtuoso of his craftsmanship, who was familiar not only with the properties of gold, but also of glass that is the raw material of enamel. Comparison of the Cedes and the Vergina diadems indicates that not only their structural elements are identical, but also that the additional elements and their arrangement are virtually the same. Thus we can conclude that the Cedes diadem is a simplified variant of the Vergina diadem in shape, decoration, and manufacturing techniques. During the study of jewelry, the documentation of the ancient and post-discovery condition also played an important role. The presence or absence of traces of ancient use, namely traces of wear, damages, and repairs, can provide additional information on the history, dating, and function of the jewelry. For example, in Tum Zita at Derveni, all the pieces of jewelry were placed in a used condition. The necklace fragment, composed of triple rigid rings, granulation and filigree rings, was placed in the tomb as a fragment. Its traces of wear and deformations show an intense and long-lasting use. Elements different from the original ones in color, shape, and manufacturing technique indicate that the pair of earrings with this canvot shape pendant was repaired at least two times before its burying. We do not know how much time was passed until the repairing, but it is unlikely that they were put on the earrings during a period longer than a few decades. This so-called rich style pair of earrings was unlikely made earlier than the beginning of the type's production, that is around the mid fourth century BC. The, uh, <coughs> sorry. the scarab in the swivel ring can be dated to much earlier. Its carnelian stone, which is much harder than gold, shows a strongly worn surface, while the ring made of gold is worn only slightly. It means that the stone had already been used elsewhere. On the basis of its shape and the extensive traces of wear, the scarab can be dated even to the fifth century BC. Use where traces and the lack of these traces together were observable on the Heracles head. Its whole surface is worn evenly, but we cannot see traces of use on its suspension ring. We can conclude that the ring was added to it later and that the jewelry is of secondary use. 
the original function of it was different. Uh, it was not originally not dependent. Based on the thick bronze wire in the neck, it could decorate the end of a rod-shaped object. The solid gold fingering was used for a long time before it was placed in the tomb that is evidenced by its worn off gold material, deformed shape, and the large quantity of scratches on its surface. On the photo taken with microscope camera can be seen clearly that the inscription is later than the scratches. This indicates that it was probably engraved just before the burial. The fingering indeed could have been a gift for the dead person. During my research, I also documented the characteristics of gold in cases they differed from the ordinary. I observed silvery inclusions of elements belonging to the platinum group in the material of several pieces of jewelry. These inclusions suggest that the gold was extracted from a river. Based on this observation and the results achieved with the comparative technical analysis, a systematic archaeometric research would help to confirm or refute the observations on the connections between pieces. We made the first step, to, uh, we made the first step some years ago here in the laboratory of the museum when it was possible to carry out a micro XRF analysis on 11 objects and it had preliminary results on the composition of the material. This showed that it would be worthwhile to continue this research, but it should be complemented by other analytical methods. In order, we will have a chance to draw conclusions on the origin of the gold and on the places of production of the objects. By comparisons with the analogies and the examination of the technical details, it was already possible to conclude that which pieces of jewelry can be associated with other regions and which pieces were most likely products of local workshops or even local inventions. Few hypotheses can be seen on the slide. This clearly indicates the other direction for the research, that is, the comparative technical analysis of the pieces with jewelry and jury making tools found in other sites and regions. I think the connection of Macedonian jewelry craft with other regions, as well as the mutual influences between the regions, can be discovered better in this way than before. Thank you very much, Mrs. Dagi.